Good afternoon, everybody. We continue to uh, honor our state universities. I have Kent State flag on today, tie on today. And um, our son-in-law, Nick, graduated from Kent State. Uh, and John, you said your father-in-law graduated from Kent State as well. So we, to all the Kent State alumni out there, uh, we, we honor you today. Think of Kent State. I want to say something about our librarians. Our the physical libraries are closed, but uh, librarians continue to work. Uh, and I guess libraries have always been kind of the center of communities, but it, it seems in the last few years they've even become more the center of communities. So I know that people miss physically going to the libraries, but the libraries continue to work and there continue to be a lot of library programs and a lot of different things that, that people uh, can do. State Library of Ohio uh, has put out a big calendar of the library-sponsored events uh, across the state of Ohio, and you can find that on coronavirus.ohio.gov. You can also go up on the library webpage, library.ohio, dot gov slash public COVID-19 programs. Again, library.ohio.gov slash public COVID-19 programs. Let me uh, talk a little bit now uh, about uh, the SNAP program and bring you an update. Uh, Ohioans enrolled in the Supplemental Nutritional Assistance Program, better known as SNAP, uh, will soon receive additional support to help them during the pandemic. Our Ohio Department of Jobs and Family Services announces today that those who did not already receive the maximum monthly allotment for their household size in March will be issued an additional payment beginning this week. In addition, all SNAP eligible households will soon be able to pick up a prepackaged box of food at their local food bank. Ohio obtained federal approval to waive administrative verifications normally required at food banks to streamline the process and limit person-to-person -person contact. So that's the news uh, today uh, in regard to, to SNAP. Uh, liquor control uh, has met and uh, issued an emergency rule and this was in response to requests from uh, restaurants uh, who have a liquor license, but also I suspect maybe from some of the folks out there who do carry out with these restaurants. Uh, and going forward during this uh, pandemic, uh, when you order a meal uh, from a restaurant and if they have a liquor license, you will be able to get up to two drinks uh, that will be prepackaged uh, that cannot be opened until you get home, uh, but two drinks per order of food. Uh, so that is the, the news from that front uh, today. We continue to evolve, and Dr. Atkins certainly is going to talk about how we're evolving in this, in this crisis. Um, by and large, uh, people living in, in congregate settings, uh, nursing homes, uh, homes for those with developmental disabilities and others, um, so far, with some exceptions, uh, we've been able to, because of their actions, uh, the actions of the people who run those homes and, and the residents as well, they've been able to keep the virus out. Now, there's, obviously, there are some exceptions and very tragic exceptions that we, we have seen and you have read about or heard about. Um, but this remains a, a, a big concern, um, as, as it should. Uh, and so I, I want to mention some things that we are now doing. Uh, to go back in time, uh, on March 13th, uh, we restricted ask access to the nursing homes and stopped any visitation. Uh, and we 
directly or re reduced access by anyone else, vendors or anyone else. And so we know that's been, been very difficult. And I, I, I've heard from people who have told me how difficult that is. And I can only imagine if you have a loved one in a nursing home, how difficult that is. But I've also heard from many people who have said it's been tough for us, uh, but we know it is, is the right thing to do. So we did that uh, very early. Uh, we now have issued rules in regard to telehealth, uh, and so uh, some of the people in the nursing home are being seen uh, by telehealth, uh, again, as another option to, to increase uh, their access to good, to good care. Uh, but we have, are doing this week some additional things. I was on a, on a phone call several hours ago, uh, and we had with Director Corcoran, uh, and she brought together uh, a lot of hospitals, uh, nursing homes, congregate care facilities, uh, all on, on, a, on a phone call. And what we're trying to do is pull people together in communities, making sure the hospitals and these settings, the nursing homes, for example, are ta talking to each other so that they are tied in very, very closely. Uh, we're putting out the best practices, continue to put that information out, and just making sure that everyone is, is approaching this on, on the same team. Um, for example, uh, we want to make sure uh, at, at kind of a, a low level, but we want to make sure that uh, every nursing home, if they get a problem, they immediately know who to call. They've got a patient, uh, they've got a staff member uh, who might have some symptoms, we want to make sure that they know exactly what the line of communication is and exactly what they have to do. Uh, so that is a, a work in progress. And for those of you who are watching who are in nursing homes or who are in other congregate settings or if you have a family member there, we want you to know that we are focused on this. Uh, we understand the priority. Uh, this is very, very important to us, as it is obviously very, very important uh, to each one of you. Uh, another thing that we have done in this regard is a director of uh, aging, Russell McElroy, put out uh, guidance on case management and community support uh, for aging and developmental disabilities community. Uh, we believe that this will help as well. Uh, yesterday I talked a little bit about uh, Ohio's prisons. And, and again, uh, the director has done a, she and her team have done a, a very, very good job in keeping the virus out of the prisons for a long time. Uh, we saw this past week that it had entered two, two of our prisons, and that was to be expected despite all the, all the best efforts uh, of the director and, the, and her staff. Um, we talked yesterday uh, about the importance uh, of going through and looking to see if there were areas where we, in fact, um, could reduce the prison population. Prisons pose a unique challenge in this pandemic. Uh, social distancing in the general population, as you know, is helping us flatten the curve. Um, you all have done a great, great job. But when we're dealing with prisons, prison inmates and correction officers, um, it's a different situation. Uh, the social distancing becomes obviously much more challenging. In regard to our prisons, uh, we have a number of responsibilities that we take very, very seriously. Uh, first, we must do all that we can to protect prison staff. Um, the vast, vast majority of them cannot work from home. Uh, we need them. We appreciate them very, very much. And we must give them uh, the best, safest working environment that we can. Second, we have a responsibility to protect the inmates who are in our custody. And that certainly includes trying to protect them and the staff from the COVID-19. Third, we also must protect the public. 
from those who may cause them harm. Uh, and that means many of the people who, the people who are in fact in prison. Social distancing in prison is difficult. Now I do want to share some good news that the director shared with me. The intake coming into the prison, this is, this is a fluid population. Everyday people are coming in, people going out. People who serve their sentences, people who have been sentenced are coming in. Um, the intake uh, is now down for the last week uh, or two, about 20%. Uh, that will certainly uh, begin and has begun to reduce the population in prison. And I want to thank uh, the people at the local level, our judges, sheriffs, and others uh, who have been involved in that. Last week, uh, I asked judges to consider the early release of 38 select offenders, 23 of whom uh, are pregnant or postpartum women. Uh, I also asked at that time uh, for the judges to take a look at 15 inmates ages 60 and up who are already approaching release. In other words, they are within 120 days of release. And so we did that and we sent those names out with, with letters uh, to judges around the state of Ohio for them to take a look uh, at those particular prisoners and see if they were, would be eligible under the statute uh, for judicial release, release that can be controlled uh, by the local judge. Since then, uh, my team has continued to carefully analyze our prison population. Finding inmates to release from prison to create more room for social distancing is frankly not easy. Uh, we have around 49,000 people in prison today, and each one of them is there for a reason. Murderers, sexual predators, people like that, we're not going to let out. That's just, we're just not going to do that. We have no intention of releasing them back into society. To protect the public, we must be smart and targeted about who we recommend for release. Let me talk about the first group that I'm announcing today. There is a long-standing statute, Ohio Revised Code 2967.18, that allows the director of Ohio's Department of Rehabilitation and Corrections to alert a group called the Correction Institution Inspection Committee of an overcrowding emergency and recommend that certain inmates be released to make more room. The CIIC is composed of members of the Ohio House and the Ohio Senate. Their purpose is to assist in the state's efforts to ensure a safe and humane correctional system. We are in an emergency, an emergency that makes the situation uh, more urgent. We are in unprecedented times, which is why I'm announcing today that we are moving forward with this process and are notifying uh, the CIIC of overcrowding in our prisons. To help relieve the situation, we believe that there are specific inmates who are already scheduled, already have a release date within the next 90 days. So these are all inmates who are within 90 days or less of being released anyway. Now, again, let me be clear. We're not asking that everyone who is scheduled to be released, everyone who is within 90 days of their time be released. Um, we start with that number and then we start narrowing it down. I want to just share with you the process that we went through. So we first started with people in our prison who are now within 90 days or less of the date when they will be, in fact, released. We then began narrowing that list down. We then eliminated those who are convicted of serious charges, such as 
sex offenses, we eliminated them. Those were homicide-related offenses, we eliminated them. Kidnapping, abduction, we eliminated them. Ethnic intimidation, eliminated them. Making terrorist threats, we eliminated them. Domestic violence, we eliminated them as well. We have also screened out those who have been denied in the past judicial release. We screened out those who have a prior incarceration in Ohio. Um, we screened out inter, interstate offenders. We screened out those who have warrants or detainers on them uh, from other states or somewhere. Um, and we also screened out those who have serious prison rule violations at any time in the last five years. Once we did that, that left us with 141 inmates who qualify for emergency release under Ohio's overcrowding emergency statute. All of them have a release date on or before July 13th, 2020. Now, these 141 inmates are all in our minimum security prisons. Prisoners in these facilities live in what's called open bays with 80 to 300 people in a large open room. They sleep in bunk beds with three feet or less between them. Because of this setup, this is where we have the potential for the fast spread of COVID-19. Again, these are individuals are already approaching the end of their sentence and releasing them slightly earlier than planned will create more social distancing for those who will be kept in custody. So I encourage uh, CI I see to give this issue their immediate attention. That's group one. Now, let me turn to a second group and describe how we are handling them. Um, again, under a different provision. There is another much smaller group of inmates who we believe should be considered for release. These are inmates who are aged 60 years of age or older and who have a chronic health condition. Again, we started with people who are 60 years of age or older and have a chronic health condition. That makes them obviously more vulnerable to COVID-19. And we look for those who had served at least half of their sentence. We looked at this group and then we started screening out. We screened out anyone who has, convict, who has been convicted of serious charges, such as, but not limited to, sex offenses, homicide-related offenses. We screened out anyone uh, been convicted of kidnapping, anyone convicted of abduction, ethnic intimidation, making terrorist threats, to, and screened out anyone who has been convicted of domestic violence. We also screened out among this group people who have been denied judicial release in the past, people who have had prior incarcerations in Ohio, they've been in Ohio prison before, uh, those who are interstate offenders, those who have warrants or detainers on them currently, and those who have had a serious prison rule violation in the last six years. So we started with those 60 and older, those people of 60 or older who have an underlying medical condition, uh, chronic health condition. We also uh, took out habitual offenders, those with two or more prior convictions. This left us with 26 inmates statewide. As I explained yesterday, under the normal procedure, I cannot, cannot quickly grant a commutation. And obviously, uh, this needs to be done quickly. Uh, under the law, we must give prosecutors, judges, and victims notice of at least 60 days, and that makes sense. And that's after all the paperwork has been filed. Because of these individuals' medical vulnerability, the fact that some would not qualify for judicial release, and the need to consider these cases quickly, I'm taking the following action. We are asking judges and prosecutors across Ohio 
who are associated with these individuals to waive the 60-day notice so that they can take these cases directly, so that we can take these cases directly to the parole board. This will be a decision then made locally by the judge, by the prosecutor. The parole board is prepared to meet starting this Friday to consider these matters. Now, in these 26 cases, it is a statutory requirement that the parole board consider and make a recommendation on each of these cases. In those cases where there are specific victims, those victims must and should receive notice, and they will be given the opportunity for their voices to be heard. After the parole board makes a recommendation on, these, uh, on each of these 26 cases, uh, I'll act quickly to make my decision in respect to each case. If the parole board recommends the sentence be commuted, the parole board can also recommend, and many times does, additional conditions upon the release of that inmate. As governor, I can accept those conditions or and or I can add additional conditions as well. If in the future then the conditions are violated, we'll send that individual back to serve the remainder of their sentence. Uh, overall, uh, these are all tough decisions. Uh, we're trying to take a measured and responsible approach, approach that protects the public but also, also tries to minimize the spread of this virus in our prisons. Now, we have a list of all 160 inmates who are up for potential release, uh, which will be made available to the press corps uh, that's covering this this afternoon, and then will be available after that to the public. Now, let me ask, uh, Lieutenant Governor, uh, to give you an update on some of the things that he's been working on. Well, thank you very much, Governor. Uh, I know that one of the things, well, one of the things I spend a lot of time on is listening to people and what's going on in their, their real life experiences as we go through this. And I spend a lot of time on the phone with small business owners, um, medium-sized business owners, even large business owners, to really understand what's happening in the economy. And then we try to respond to the things that people are telling us need to occur, or at least that they would like to occur. And some of the things that have happened along the way have been uh, Bureau of Workers' Compensation deferrals, uh, grace periods for property casualty, health insurance, the, the loan program, which was in the CARES Act for small businesses through the Payment Protection Program, and disaster relief. Uh, some of those loans, remind you, are, are forgivable. Uh, sick leave requirements, layoff alternatives, um, business uh, relief for, for small businesses and not-for-profits, essential business dispute orders, uh, safe workplace regulations, all of these things uh, are, are really important, and they've been spread out kind of throughout our coronavirus.ohio.gov website, and we've kind of put these together one by one. But today we're announcing uh, a, a collaboration, uh, pulling together of all of those services uh, under one roof in the Office of Small Business Relief. The Office of Small Business Relief will help coordinate the efforts and, and identify ways to provide support for the nearly 950,000 small businesses that are operating in Ohio. Uh, the Office of Small Business Relief will be housed in the Developmental Services Agency, uh, where direct Director Lydia Mahalik and her team reside. Uh, they are uniquely qualified to handle this. We feel, we feel that they will do a fantastic job. They're gonna really be there to help people navigate uh, the recovery fund, component of this uh, for small businesses, regulatory reform issues, uh, and other services like the Ohio Small Business Development Center and the Mayor Minority Business Assistant Centers. They run these things, uh, and they're going to help navigate through not only the services that they normally provide, but also all of these things that have been added in the interim to help businesses navigate through this difficult period of time. And uh, this will all be um, 
This will be at our uh, coronavirus.ohio.gov slash business help uh, component. Uh, there's a brand new page there under that. It's easy to navigate. It's just dedicated, dedicated business. And at the bottom of that, after you read through it, if your questions don't get answered, because we have frequently asked questions, the ones that they get the most, we put the answers in there to try to help make this simple for folks. But if you get through it and if your answer's not there, there's also an email address and a telephone number that you can call for additional assistance. And we hope that that will, um, you know, this is, like I said, we listen to what small business are telling us. We listen to what people are saying they're having a hard time navigating, and we, we hope that this new office will help with that. Uh, additionally, I mention every day since we started this, the number of critical businesses in healthcare, in the food supply chain, manufacturers who are trying to help us ramp up to produce PPE. They have th now over 30,000 <coughs> jobs uh, at, at uh, our job search website uh, under the coronavirus ohio.gov slash job search. Over 30,000 jobs. I know a lot of folks are out of work, folks maybe who've had their plans for the spring disrupted. Please go take a look at that. See if there's something there that you might help. Uh, the plea that we get from businesses every day about trying to hire people in, in these essential, and I will even use the word critical, uh, business sectors uh, are on there, and we encourage you to go take a look at that. And I, and I had this call, I keep getting this call from a lot of folks who just, I know that they're looking for certainty out there. They wanna know what the future looks like. And believe us, we wanna know what the future looks like too, uh, more than we could possibly ever communicate to you. And we understand that that uncertainty is a difficult place to live. And I keep getting the question, you know, when, when will things get opened back up? And, and I, wanna, I wanna give some, what I think is helpful advice. Understand that, that this will not be at the point in time when we start to see the, the, the cases go down and, and the hospitals not be filled up as much as they, we expect them to be. It's not gonna happen like flipping a switch. This will be gradual. So businesses out there, think about how you're going to prepare for this, uh, how you're gonna prepare for the safe workplace environment that you need to have, uh, on the hygiene front, on the social distancing front, on maybe even having masks and other things available for your workforce. Because what you don't want to have happen is that when you open back up that you have a, a spread of the coronavirus right in your own workplace because that will decimate your workforce and, and it will do the opposite of what we're trying to do. And as I stood here yesterday saying that Ohioans have been doing a better job. I mean, you've done, you've done a great job, but that is not licensed to let up. It is, it is to say to you that if we keep going, if we stay on this track, we're going to get through this faster. And, but know that these, these safe practices are gonna be with us for a while, even as we, as we look to the future and start to ease out. So, so know that it will all be very gradual and that, and that we're working on plans that will help you navigate that and, and help make this as orderly, orderly and thoughtful of a process as possible. And I know that you know, I spend a lot of time on this. The governor has to do everything. Uh, and Dr. Acton and I try to take our parts. Uh, and I want, you to, I want the business owners out there to know that your voices are being heard. We're listening and we're trying to plan with you to figure out what the best way is to go forward when that time comes. Governor? Lieutenant Governor, thank you very much. Dr. Acton. Thank you. Um, thank you, Governor, Lieutenant Governor. Um, I think the message the Lieutenant Governor just gave is so, so important. I, I think back to some of our early talks together, and we talked about a tolerance for ambiguity and the evolving and sort of um, unprecedented nature of what we're facing. And I want you to know that we are working tirelessly behind the scenes, be, behind the scenes of what you're seeing here, fighting every day to get you the information you need. Uh, and we appreciate all you're doing. Today, uh, I wanna start out with our numbers as I usually do. We have confirmed today uh, 4,000 782 cases, and unfortunately, we have now seen 167 deaths in the state of Ohio, 
and we have cases in 81 counties. Uh, next slide. A couple of things to point out here. Um, we still um, are looking at about 50,000 tested. We're still facing shortages of different testing reagents, different test kits, but we're really maximizing the testing as best we can. Uh, behind the scenes, the lieutenant governor has taken the lead on finding some of the most precious kind of testing that will get us out of this, the kind of testing I've been talking about, the blood testing, serologic. Um, we've, we've made some amazing progress on that front, uh, thanks to his efforts. And I'll be telling you more about that in the days to come. But at this point, for most of us, uh, I know most of you are staying at home without that testing. But using these numbers, we can say that we are still slightly more females um, becoming ill. Uh, unfortunately, slightly more males in our, our death numbers thus far. All of this data is still lagging far behind. Many of our test results are, are from tests that are still coming back from the private sector. Uh, but this is what we know right now. Um, and ICU admissions still staying at about 9%. That's a very important number for us. Uh, next slide. So I want to take a moment to talk about modeling and take us back to the very beginning of some of these decisions we made early on around social distancing. If you remember, as this was evolving, you know, this is a pandemic of a scale that has not been seen in our lifetimes. And we went back, you know, knowing what we were knowing, watching China, watching other countries, uh, learning from the science, we realized that very early on we needed to be St. Louis and not Philadelphia. We've since seen other cities around the country and around the world that have taken different measures at different times. And that's made all the difference in their trajectory, thinking about cities like um, Lodi and uh, Bergamo in Italy, very geographically close, but taking some different decisions. And, and, and we knew so it was so important, way back from that national pandemic guidance, that plan about the non-pharmacologic interventions. Those were the Swiss cheese efforts, from limiting mass gatherings to closing schools, to all the measures on social distancing we've taken, we said that none of them are perfect alone, that it really is like slices of Swiss cheese. When you layer them slightly over the holes with each layer, collectively that makes a difference. And what we now know here in Ohio and around the world is it truly works. But it's so important for us to think about this when we think about modeling. There's a lot being said about modeling right now, and it is, it is not a science that predicts our outcome. It's our actions that predict our outcome. So when we made those, those initial decisions, modeling wasn't even available yet because there wasn't data yet to put in models. So remember that modeling is still like a weather forecast. And even weather forecasters don't use one model. They use multiple, and they take a wide range of things. And similarly, when we look at the modeling for this pandemic, we look at the most conservative worst case scenarios, and we heard some of that in our very conservative sort of Cleveland Clinic model originally. And we look at some of the other modeling that is showing much better outcomes. But it's so important, all these modeling do, all of it collectively points us in a general direction of decision making that we can use to make some guesstimates about maybe when a peak will be, maybe when we'll need more ventilators than not. But it's very, very general directional science. It's important to think about worst case scenarios because what we want to do and everything we've done is rule out the worst case. Worst case would be having to make really hard decisions about scarce resources. We know we have large shortages of things like PPE and ventilators, and we are doing everything we can to never have to make that decision. But if we don't know what a worst case is, we can't aim well and we can't prevent that. And so similarly, we look at the best case scenarios and we're very optimistic and hopeful, but we have to continue to think about worst case scenarios. So let me show you our original curve. This is an oldie but goodie. Eric's moving, if you remember, our original curve. This was before we had modeling or any numbers that could tell us exactly 
where we would be in the future. But we had learned from all the strategic national plans, as well as the past, that if you do no social distancing, no Swiss cheese, um, your curve looks like this. If you do the very aggressive measures we're taking in this country, you flatten the curve and you spread it out. Now remember, you peak a lot sooner if you do nothing. But what you do, remember our black line, is that you overwhelm the healthcare system. And we've seen the sad, sad experience of countries that didn't have the time that we have bought here in Ohio. Um, we saw in Italy what that looks like. It's heartbreaking. We see some cities like New York really struggling to not have to face those decisions. So here in Ohio, right now, the good news is the efforts you are taking have kept us below that hospital capacity. We still have capacity in our hospitals from doing things like getting rid of elective surgeries. All of these are costly, painful measures, but they have kept us under this curve. In fact, right now our modeling is showing us even flatter than the blue in this original curve, stretching our, our peak out a little further. It's stretching out the onset of the spread of disease. Um, but it's very important to remember that within two weeks, if we let up within two weeks, we will easily bounce back above that curve. Vitally, vitally important, Ohio. You've done this. You're winning the war to protect our scarce resources and keeping our hospitals being able to deal with this. But the second we let our foot off the gas, the second we are no longer that Category 3 hurricane, it can pick up wind again, and we can be a Category 5. I want to show you some other numbers. This right now, I'll go back. I'm sorry, Eric. This is taking a look at the onset of our measures. We are the yellow bar, and we're looking a little bit here at some other states, New York, Michigan, the United States writ large, Ohio, where we are now, we're this yellow line. Now, it's important to know that there was also, there was already the spread of this disease before anyone took any measures. We now know that asymptomatic folks were spreading it. We know now that some areas of our country were seeded earlier than others. Certainly if you have a lot more international travel and airport, when we look like a city at like Detroit, we know that they're being harder hit right now. Ohio, they're just a little ahead of us on this curve. We're lucky because we all took measures, New York, Michigan, and we did. Um, it's really, really important to know that New York's just a little bit ahead of us on the curve. Um, they, they had spread sooner in a community fashion probably than we did, but we can go back and, and see the same kinds of things they're seeing. So we must, this is where Ohio is. We're a little flatter in our curve right now. We're spreading it out over more time, but we can't become complacent. There's something else to look at, next slide. So this data, this is new, this is on our website because I know it's very hard to see on TV. But we also, even within our spread in Ohio, it's not gonna be perfectly even. I keep saying we're gonna have hot spots and flare ups in different parts of our states at different times. And it's so important, we have to have these measures across our state. This disease spreads so rapidly, it's so lethal. But you can see that some of these things, the, the governor was mentioning, prisons, nursing homes, hospice care, VA homes that we have in our state, psych hospitals, places where people have to be close together for various reasons are more at risk. They have more vulnerable populations. And you'll see some of that, and it's why it's so important that we are not spreading this disease, we're not spreading it to the workers in these settings who have to go in and come home. So everything we're doing is helping protect our most vulnerable, but we're starting to be able to see some hot spots, some flares, that come with cases um, up near Detroit, um, around some nursing home issues we faced, around a prison, around some nursing homes in Youngstown. These are hot spots that'll flare up, they'll recede, they can flare up again. That's why we're building a hospital system alongside our nursing home partners to be able to triage the best help and resources wherever those flare ups occur in our state. We're rushing PPE that we have to places that need it more. We'll be able to move ventilators 
to hospitals that need it more. And we'll be able to triage people if a hospital is reaching a capacity to a nearby hospital. All of that is the planning time that you helped us buy. Next slide. So we right now are this blue line in Ohio. Please, Ohioans, we've got a couple hard weeks ahead of us. It is the social distancing that we're doing. It is the sacrifices that we are making in our businesses, and they are painful sacrifices. We have hospitals that do a lot of elective surgeries that aren't getting the income that they would normally get. There's no business untouched right now. And we've got to know that the sacrifices we are making do not let up. They have to be worth it. If we let up, we will change our trajectory and look more like that original yellow curve. Next slide. I wanted to say a little bit, people ask a lot about ventilators. And we don't have accurate numbers exactly yet of every ventilator that's in our hospitals. We're getting those this week. But I want to show you what we did about the ventilators that were elsewhere in the state. We actually didn't ask for all the ambulatory surgical facilities from all sorts of spots around our state where people donated information about ventilators that they can contribute to this cause. So in addition to the ventilators we're trying to purchase as a state, we have come up with 805 additional ventilators, folks who will give up their machines, and we can move those to where they are needed. We found 577 anesthetic machines. We have BiPAP, CPAP, and medical ventilators. Um, all available, I'm sorry, these are our responses, 805. So we have thousands of machines that have been donated to the cause because of, of work um, around our state. So that is a great number. Next slide. And I believe that gets us done. Two last things I'd like to say. Um, I really want to um, remind you that um, there are issues that get worse during times like this, not least of which we've talked about the horrible you know, unemployment numbers and things that folks are facing. We also fear at times like this that we can see from past um, traumas and um, weather accidents and things that there can be uptake, upticks of violence and especially uh, domestic violence. We mentioned this briefly before, but I want to remind people that you can ask for help. There is help available. If you're experiencing anything like that from domestic violence, human trafficking, child abuse, or elder abuse, we have hotlines on our website to help, coronavirus.ohio.gov. There is the Ohio Sexual Violence Helpline, 844-OHIO-HELP, and that'll be on our website, the National Domestic Violence Hotline, and you can actually text for help, love is to two, two, five, two, two, love is. And it's really important. Um, I know there's a lot of times that people can feel isolated, but if you are experiencing something and you need help, reach out to your provider, reach out to one of these resources. Um, we want to help you. So thank you so much, Ohio. Keep up the good work. You are winning the war. We are helping our hospitals. We are staying below that line. Uh, don't let up now. Thank you. Dr. Atkin, thank you very much. And we'll take a question. Mr. Adi is first. Jim Adi from WHIO TV. Thank you, Governor, for doing this. Best case scenario, what would be the timeline that we would start to see some of those inmates make their way out? And secondly, do you have a, a thought about how the parole system may, parole board may be able to get those people into a good situation when they leave the facility? Usually, that takes a lot of time. What do you think? Thank uh, you. Jim, this, 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 the second question. I'm sorry, I didn't get the second question, Jim. When they leave, where do they go? Yes, when they're released, where do they go and who makes sure that that's a good place? Yeah, and, and that's uh, something that, uh, you know, the director uh, and her team will ensure uh, we're not dumping anybody out. Um, you know, last week we talked about the, the, the pregnant women, uh, women who had just recently had children, um, and I've been assured that each one of them, there is a plan. Uh, there's a plan in place. There's a place for, for them to go, and that would be true, again, with, with these individuals as well. So uh, we would not dump these individuals out. 
another thing that we um, would, would also be announcing, uh, depending on where this person was coming from, uh, in regard to if they were in a prison or an area that had the COVID-19, there'd have to be some arrangement uh, to deal with that as well. So that would be something that we, would, we will announce um, in a few days, generally, how we, will, how we will handle that. He had a quick question about timetable, <laughs> a follow-up for that. When would this happen? Well, I'm, I'm sorry, what, when would what? I just missed the question, I apologize. Uh, my question, I'm with ABC6, this is Tara Morgan. My question is your thoughts on antibody testing. Governor Cuomo had talked about it this morning in New York, developing the test and working with the F FDA. Uh, what does that look like here in Ohio? Well, it certainly will be very, very helpful. Uh, we know that. I'm gonna let the doctor uh, respond to that. Okay. So antibody testing and the FDA recently approved that, and I'm actually gonna let the Lieutenant Governor share some information about this as well, because he's sort of the hero in helping us work to procure it. But um, antibodies will be um, what's formed in our bodies as we fight off this infection. We know that there is some immunity that builds up, and that immunity um, can be detected. It's um, through a serologic blood test, actually a finger prick test, which will be amazing, similarly to giving glucose um, and a sugar diabetes check. And, and that will let us know that you have had the disease and have fought it off. No one is absolutely certain yet how long that immunity lasts. Um, those antibodies, um, there's some hope that they're lasting well into a year. There's some studies being done now, but we're still not sure. We always expect that as a, a fighting off of reaction. It's not a lifetime immunity. So that's why we so desperately need a vaccine. But that test is gonna be so essential because we know we have not, we've tested just the tip of the iceberg. Our testing is telling us about history, not what's happening currently. So we'll be able to go back and learn more about who has actually had the disease and who has fought it off um, successfully. And that will be a big part of our strategy um, to be able to resume life and get back to normal. You can imagine if you have a healthcare worker who knows they've already fought off the disease, they can go back to work and sort of be part of the solution. Now eventually, you know, this disease will continue to spread. It's gonna spread because none of us are immune. We'll reach levels at a certain place where we'll have more herd immunity when enough of us had had, have had it, we're much less likely to spread it. We'll get back to the point where when someone gets it, we can test them right away. And, and then contact trace and be able to limit that spread. But that's part of our future. I'd like to give uh, just a moment to the Lieutenant Governor to talk about what he's been doing to fight uh, to get this because it's so, so important for our recovery phase. Yeah, th thank you, Dr. Acton. Uh, we, you know, we do these phone calls about what the future looks like and what the exit strategy is. And we, we talked about how Important. I will listen to Dr. Acton and others in the healthcare industry talk about how important these are to knowing, particularly in hospital settings and things like that, who may have built up the immunity, uh, as, as we often hear, that most people who get it will never be tested or, or we won't know that. But with this test, we can, we can find out who those folks are to help create uh, some confidence among those individuals that, that, they're, that they're, they can be more exposed without running the risk that somebody who hasn't had uh, the COVID-19 um, uh, infection, uh, the virus spread in their body. Um, and so hearing that, I started making calls to every one of these companies that I could find in the country, uh, starting with US companies first. Uh, and we have identified uh, several leads on, on these tests. We are busily trying to acquire those tests, many of them are not ready now, but we could use them now, but we're gonna need them out into the future. So we are aggressively pursuing uh, having those tests in Ohio because they are a critical part of the exit strategy. Hi, this is Molly Martinez with Spectrum News. My question is for the Lieutenant Governor. We've been inundated with viewer um, comments saying that they go to the unemployment website and they are constantly reaching dead ends. 
um, that it's backlogged, that it's not necessarily a problem with bandwidth, but that the site keeps crashing. And they're getting desperate. This has been a month now that they just don't have any sort of income. What would you say to those people who every day are trying to get past this system and, and can't make any headway? Well, I can, I can tell you this. First of all, um, that frustrates me too. I think it frustrates all of us when we can't deliver something that we know somebody needs. And uh, every single day, uh, I'm on the phone with the team uh, over at ODJFS that's working on that. We're constantly talking with them about their strategy. I was just looking through the numbers. Um, you know, when they come out on Thursday, you're going to see that they are processing a record number. There's, there's, no, there's no time in history that's ever even come close to the amount of unemployment claims that they're processing right now. But we still know that that, is, that doesn't mean that everybody has a great experience. Uh, and, and so my, what I can say to them right now is that, one, their benefits will be backdated to the point that they were eligible. So even if they are not getting through immediately, uh, that they are backdated to the point they're eligible so they won't lose any benefits because of the technology challenges. That uh, we continue to ups upgrade, they're now uh, currently 829 employees, they've added over 500 employees, I think it is, since we started uh, with this. They've added 20 times the capacity to the servers. Uh, it, it, it is sort of maxed out in that area. That runs 24 hours a day. So going through during peak hours, maybe you want to choose a different time. Is there that another would allow time that would be better? Well, it, it's it's usually usually the times that are peak are are in the mornings and the afternoons that you tend to see you tend to see peak hours during them according to the latest data that I have. I'm just looking through this to make sure that I can give you as complete of an answer as possible. Uh, there have been 114 million dollars, over, over 114 million dollars have already been paid out since the, this started uh, to over 180,000 people. So that's processing uh, as, as fast as they can validate someone's eligibility. And, and so the team is, is building out capacity. I will have a more complete update on Thursday when the unemployment numbers come out. But we're, we hear your frustration. We are pushing the system to build capacity to train the people that they need to come in and do this. Uh, and and uh, I'll have more on that on Thursday, but please let everybody know they will get their benefits as soon as they're el from the date they were eligible for them coming through. And we, we apologize that it is not better, but it is getting better. And, and I share the frustration and, and the sense of urgency that they have. Thank you. Hi, this is Jesse Balmer with the Cincinnati Inquirer. I guess given the weather forecast like nature of modeling, how will we know when we've reached the peak? And do we have enough tools like testing to make that determination? Dr. Acton? Yes, hi, Jesse. Um, we will know it by tracking, you know, if we can stay at the testing levels we'll at now. Um, and that's an if because we struggle to find reagent even as we speak. I mean, we are struggling uh, to keep up the testing even at the, the pace we are. There's just a scarcity. It's not our state. It's everywhere. And, and we're all on allotments of, of small amounts of the necessary ingredients. So, But if, let's say we stay at the amount of cases, we're going to see those cases go up. They're going to go up and down on a given day. So we, can, we never want to make any quick decisions based on anything, but you will see it. What we're thinking now is it's going to plateau. It will be flatter and longer at the top. Um, and then you'll start to see the cases per day go down um, and start to level the number of new cases. Uh, one of the problems in this is, depending on how we handle social distancing, we could see a spike back up again. So you know, we still believe at this point um, if we're following on the trajectory we've been on, that it will be late April, mid to late April, early May. That's sort of a clump of time that still holds true. Uh, but but it, there's no guarantee of that. Some of it has to do also with the subtleties of the spread within community. If we have a ton of these hot spots and those catch 
that kind of will give us a little bump for a while, and then we see cases go down. We've been very successful so far with our flare-ups. Um, being able to come alongside, the locals are doing a great job of the contact investigation that needs to go on right around an outbreak, say an outbreak in a nursing home. Um, and then we at the state, our epidemiologists, our medical team is coming alongside that. When we see that a nursing home is struggling because they don't have enough gear, the very little bit of gear we have left, we're trying to direct to them. So we've been able to sort of squash the hot spots um, as they occur, but you know, time will tell how well, that, how well we do at that. So I, I do still suspect our, our peak will be in there. We still aren't quite sure the number of cases per day. They could be as low, the ranges on the lowest end have been closer to 2,000 cases per day at the peak. On the higher end models, they were as high as you heard at one point of 10,000. That 10,000 was based on less successful social distancing. So the more we keep the social distancing going, so I'm saying if we can keep this going these few more weeks while we go through the probably what will be the hardest time, um, we will see those number of cases per day stay lower but we'll never know the actual amount because we'll never know how many cases are at home, mildly ill, but perhaps could even have been deaths that just have not been attributed to this. And it will be in retrospect that we fully understand it. Thank you. Adrian Robbins, NBC4, and my questions for the governor or possibly the lieutenant governor. Um, I was hoping that somebody could expand a little bit on this, this new rule for restaurants allowing carryout orders. Are these cocktails? What exactly is being allowed? And also, is the state looking for ways like this, unique ways that allow people to stay safe, continue the stay-at-home order, but at the same time help businesses that are obviously str struggling during this time? Uh, the answer to the question is yes. I mean, we are looking for ways, obviously, to to help our, our restaurants, those who can do carry out. Uh, though we certainly encourage people to uh, patronize their, their their local restaurant. Um, as far as the liquor controls uh, decision, uh, you know, this has to do basically with hard liquor. Uh, it's a specific request we receive from restaurants who already have a liquor license. This is not some new license. This is a license they already have. They normally could be serving liquor uh, in, in their restaurant uh, as a part of their, their, their restaurant, their meals. Um, and so the specific request was, can they, as part of the meal that you get to carry out, can you have a drink? Or in this case, can you have two drinks? Uh, and so that decision was yes, and that's what the new, new rule allows them, them to do. Um, that's pretty much it. Thank you. I, the only thing I, I would add to that is that, is that we, this is all part of what we do. We listen to people. We listen to the restaurants. They told us that really the economics uh, of trying to stay open during the time uh, you know, that this really helps them make ends meet. And so it's really just that dialogue that we continue to have with businesses about ways that we can help them get through the difficult time. Thank you. Jim Province with the Toledo Blade. This is a question for the governor. Um, Tom Noe is one of those, Tom Noe from the CoinGate scandal is one of the 26 that you are recommending for potential release depending on what the, par the parole board does. You already have a petition on your desk where the uh, parole board has recommended that he not be released. Can you tell me how this new process would be different from that process and how much of uh, a role the coronavirus itself has to play in that final decision? Sure. So we started by looking, and I went through the process, I won't go through it again, but we started looking at people 60 years of age who had a medical problem. And the whole idea was, look, these are the most vulnerable uh, if they get the coronavirus. Uh, these are the people most likely to have a very serious medical con situation or, or, to, or to die. So we started screening them out. Uh, and then we, you know, superimposed some qualification on that. We're not going to let rapists out, murderers out. And we went, went through a list that I read of people. So we went through all that process, and we came up with 26 names. Uh, frankly, I would have thought it would have been more. Uh, but that's what we ended up with, is, is 26 people who, who, who qualified. Um, each one of those has to have uh, a 
has to go through a process. Um, Noah had already gone through the process, as you know. Uh, this was before I became governor. Uh, the parole board had met. Uh, recommended, uh, turn, turn his rec turn, did not have a favorable recommendation to Governor Kasich. Uh, nothing's really happened on that. I've not taken any action on that. So it, it seemed to me that what we should do is treat all these 26 the same, uh, and that is send them all to the parole board and ask the parole board to look at them, make a recommendation, come back. If they do have a recommendation for release, the parole board, uh, you know, we're asking the parole board will come back with conditions. Uh, for, and so those of the 26 that come back to me with a favorable recommendation, um, you know, we will look at it. I mean, we'll look at all of them, but the, obviously the ones that come back with a favorable recommendation, we're going we're to look at, see if the conditions are, if we want to add any additional con conditions and then, then take an action. So no, he's different only in the sense that he'd already gone through that process, but he has not gone through that process recently. And so it just seemed to me fair to everybody to treat everybody the same in that group, um, send them off to the parole board, see what the parole board does, and see where we go in the, in the process from there. And how much of a role does the coronavirus situation play in that decision? Does it become the predominant factor? Well, I don't think we would, you know, we wouldn't have done this without the coronavirus, uh, frankly. I mean, I don't think that, you know, I wouldn't have gone like this probably. Um, I mean, it's a logical thing. thing. It's not illogical without the coronavirus. You, you could have looked at the situation in prison and, and you could have decided, well, this is a way to, to you know, decide who comes out. But it, we, we would not have done that, I don't think, without the coronavirus. So the process was... For all three groups, the group we had last week and the two groups today, those were really set in place because of the coronavirus. And we started looking at the prison and thinking, okay, well, you know, who should come out? And how do you set that criteria? And we got different statutes and things that we would have to qualify for. And so we looked at the different tools that are available uh, and this is this is what we came up with. As I said, we came up probably with fewer people than we would have thought. But again, that's that's what we ended up with based on the screens that we put on and, and the screening process that that we went through. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Andy Chow with Ohio Public Radio and Television State House News Bureau. I th this is for the governor and for Dr. Acton. I wanted to revisit the issue of when and if hospitals do reach capacity and they have to make the decision of who, which patients to use respirators for. Where are we in the process? Is the state creating statewide guidelines for that situation? And will those guidelines be made public to everybody? Sure, and thank you very much. First of all, I wake up every day with the determination and go to bed every night and work all day that we never get there. Uh, we do not want to be in what we've seen on TV, not blaming anybody, but we don't want to be in that position. And so every single day we work on this and we do it two ways. We try to flatten the curve, try to spread this thing out. Everybody out there is working on this who's staying at home. Everyone is helping who's keeping their social distance at the same time. We're asking our manufacturers to come forward and make stuff, uh, make ventilators, for example. At the same time, uh, we're trying to procure things such as personal protection uh, uh, equipment so that we don't have that situation where life and death decisions have to be made because there's a scarcity of something. Uh, so we're not going to get there. I mean, we're, it's not going to happen. Now, let me, but let me address exactly what you, you, you said. Uh, it is my understanding that many hospitals already have a procedure in how they triage or how they deal when there's a scarcity or when tough, tough decisions have to be made. Uh, my understanding uh, is that the Ohio Hospital Association has been putting together um, a document uh, like the one that you referenced. They have had some input from a lot of different people. They've had input uh, from the, the health department uh, uh, along with others. 
uh, it's my understanding that that document went out yesterday and was circulated among the members. I have not seen the document. I, I have not read it. Uh, it seems to me that the process that is taking place with the Ohio Hospital Association is a, a good process. Uh, people will have the opportunity, should have the opportunity. Uh, if, if they look at this and see something they don't like, they should obviously complain about it. It's my understanding they, they reached out. I'm told that they reached out to the disability community. They reached out to others to, to get input. And so that, that is where uh, that is. Um, I think this is something that people uh, look at ethical issues obviously should be very, very involved in. The medical community should be very, very involved in. The public should have a right um, to, to take a look at that. And that's my understanding is that process is, is now taking place. Thank you. Kevin Landers, WBNS 10 TV, Columbus. Uh, my question is for Dr. Acton and perhaps Lieutenant Governor as well. Um, my question is, what is the survivability of someone who was on a ventilator with COVID-19? And do you think we have enough in ventilators today? And if not, can we buy more? So that is a hotly debated issue. Again, the science is evolving on this disease. And as you know, it is, it is a terribly um, pernicious disease, 20 times as fatal as the flu. And what I'm seeing in the clinical case, you know, is, is it's not a good one. People can even do well in the first week, excuse me, and they, you know, sometimes when people take a turn for the worse, they do so very rapidly. There's a huge autoimmune uh, response that occurs with this particular disease um, that the inflammation itself is causing damage, not just a typical pneumonia that we might see as a consequence. So, so using ventilators, um, having enough drugs, the right drugs to use with a ventilator is also an issue we're hearing about out of New York. Um, and, and, that, and that the survivability on the very little bit of data we have so far is not as good as sometimes people hope for. But there aren't, I don't have numbers for you to give you on that. It's so important that we get people to treatment soon if they're really experiencing that difficulty breathing. Um, we do at this point have more than enough ventilators for our current capacity. We have actually a good range. Our hospitals right now by and large are at about 48% on average capacity. We've taken the very hard hit of really keeping most stuff out of the hospital so that we have that bandwidth. Um, we've also been purchasing and we're into purchase ventilators. We had others, we had some in stockpile. Mostly we have, or we're now rerouting existing ventilators that haven't been in use by hospitals. Uh, so, so right now we look very good uh, on that, but as, as we say over and over again, let's never get to a position where we even have to think about that. Let's use the equipment we have. There's also the whole treatment that is going on in standards of care. Physicians are learning a lot every day about the best ways to treat this. Um, anything from putting patients in a more prone position on that ventilator to the types of drugs they're using. But again, it, it's a tough disease and um, it can be very discouraging, I know, to those on the front lines. Thank you. And just make it clear, we are seeking more ventilators and we have manufacturers who are who are, who are working on that. Uh, and so we are trying to get more ventilators into the state. Absolutely. Could, could, I, could I make a, a point that I wanna, just to that question on ventilators, we, we have a team, the manufacturing team is working on it, the acquisition team at the EOC uh, is working on it. And it's just, this is a little redundant. This is what the governor and Dr. Act can talk about every day. How many ventilators you need is really dependent on how well we do social distancing and how well we, we abide by these safety measures so that the peak isn't as high and that we can make sure that we have them. But So there's a two-prong approach to this. It's, it's the safety precautions that are being taken to reduce the spread, reduce the peak, 
and the acquisition and, and, and building of that capacity. So all of those issues contribute to the solution which we are working on on all fronts. Hi, Max Philby with the Columbus Dispatch. Uh, for the governor, um, we have heard from prison workers up in Marion who are concerned about a lack of PPE and testing for people who are maybe showing symptoms. Uh, can you tell us, I guess, what the state's doing to address some of those concerns? Sure, and we'll have, we'll have the, the director uh, sometime this week to come in uh, by Skype and, and give a direct report on that. Um, the director, uh, you know, starting uh, way back uh, a number of weeks ago, started uh, doing the testing, uh, started uh, temperature uh, on people who were coming into the prison. Uh, we stopped having visitors come into the prison some time ago. Uh, but if there are specific uh, concerns, uh, certainly we, we, will, we will look at those. Uh, you know, I have great concern for the people who work in our prison. Uh, we do have COVID-19 in Marion, uh, as well as in Pickaway, and those are uh, areas that we have a, a great deal of concern. Uh, I, what I hear you saying is that some of them may not have uh, the protective uh, equipment, and I certainly will talk to the director about that Good afternoon, uh, Ben Schwartz from WCPO in Cincinnati. Um, Governor DeWine, I want to ask you about the, um, the enforcement of large gatherings. Um, over the weekend, there was an incident in uh, over the Rhine with a man getting arrested. Um, and we just wanna know if it's up to the cities in particular to enforce those and make arrests if deemed necessary. And if so, how you recommend cities go about that? Well, the answer is yes. Uh, every day at 1130, uh, uh, Lieutenant Governor and I, and, and many times Dr. Acton, are on the phone with the mayors of our major cities. Uh, they have done a phenomenal job. Uh, one of the reasons that we are not uh, in, in the crisis uh, that we might have been, uh, we're still in a crisis, but we're, that curve is not going up as dramatically as it might have been, is because of what these mayors have done. Uh, so the enforcement of that law this weekend, uh, you know, I shout out to the law enforcement agencies, to uh, Prosecutor Dieters uh, and Mayor Cranley uh, and others who took uh, affirmative action to deal with that. Uh, I, I applaud them for what they're doing. So we look to the local communities, uh, we look to the local police, we look to the local sheriffs uh, to to deal with those, those type situations. I mean, as you know, and I don't know if all our viewers know this, but it was a pretty flagrant uh, violation. Uh, this is someone who created their own uh, video, put it up on social media, uh, you know, show, showed that there was not distancing occurring and basically kind of mocked the whole idea that we should have social distancing. So, you know, uh, when, when someone, uh, you know, kind of convicts themselves, so to speak, and post that, that that's, their, that's their problem. And, uh, you know, it was, it was pretty crazy. So I applaud, uh, again, what, what all the mayors have been doing. Uh, they've been doing a, a good job, and the police departments around the state as well. Thank you. Hi, Governor. This is Julie Carsmyth at the Associated Press. Uh, I think my question's for Dr. Acton. Um, Doctor, <laughs> you, hi, you um, had mentioned that the hospitals are at about 48% right now. Um, are there any cases you're seeing where people without COVID issues are afraid to go to the hospital or not getting needed hospital care? And do you have a sense for that and, and what advice you would give to them? Uh, I, I have not, that has not been raised to me in any form. I do think it's really important. We, you know, part of our trying to keep this capacity in check is because people do need the hospital for other things. People are going to get in car accidents. They're going to have heart attacks and strokes or a baby, and and part of our keeping this hospital capacity open is for them too. So um, I really hope that people reach out to their provider. Um, I know a lot of us are trying to use telemedicine or the phone as a first line. Um, that's not always possible, 
Um, and if you're having trouble and you can't find someone or you're, you're not being able to reach your provider, do reach out, still call and talk to your emergency room, the one that's closest to you that you would normally use. Um, we really, it's really important that all of us can access our healthcare system. A lot of what we've done is anything that is not critical in terms of elective surgery has just been delayed a bit through this peak time to we're sure we have all the resources. But certainly if your condition changes, reach out. I mean, it's really important. I don't want you to be afraid to go. Our hospitals are working tirelessly. They've set up ways so that people that do not are not sick with COVID can be separated. They're taking precautions with you just in case you're asymptomatic. So, so please still use the necessary resources you need to. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, Director Acton. Hello. Uh, this is a question for Governor DeWine. <laughs> Very nice. Yeah, sure. I mean, it's like watching there. Yeah. Hi, <laughs> Governor DeWine. Uh, Paul Teasley, The Hannah Report. Uh, clearly, most incarcerated persons are staying right where they are, uh, at least for now, with the challenging nature of detention, which you've mentioned, and if you think about it for two minutes, it's obviously a huge challenge. And with the changing weather, what consideration have you given to uh, moving inmates into temporary shelters uh, in prison yards, perhaps uh, minimum security, nonviolent uh, inmates uh, with added, uh, added guards, uh, either now or, or in the future or, or some similar measure? Uh, you know, that's a decision uh, that I would leave up to the director. Uh, the director has many, many years experience in, in prisons. Um, I'll take that issue up with her, but, uh, you know, the management of the prison, uh, by and large, we leave to the wardens and we leave to the director. Uh, this is an unusual time, and uh, because it's an unusual time, um, you know, I, I ask a lot of questions, and uh, I, I can tell uh, everyone who's got a family member in the prison or anyone who has a family member who works in the prison, I continue to ask the director a lot of questions. I have great, great confidence in her. I great, have great confidence in her team. But, you know, how we uh, try to protect uh, staff, how we try to protect the prisoners is something that we look at uh, every, every single day, and we're going to continue to do that, continue to have a focus on it. Thank you, Governor. Thank you. Good afternoon. It's Laura Bischoff, Dayton Daily News. My question is for Governor DeWine. Um, I read the Ohio Hospital Association's plan that was circulated, and um, it notes that hospitals are working on their own plans individually, and this isn't a statewide plan. Does Ohio have the, the legal authority to direct public and privately held hospitals to follow one set of protocol? And without that, wouldn't Ohio have a patchwork of policies and possibly uneven, you know, fairness issues statewide? Uh, the answer, Laura, I said, I don't know. I don't know if we have that legal authority or not. Um, it, as far as how this is going to play out, uh, my understanding was that this, this was being circulated. Uh, my understanding was the goal to have the hospitals all agree uh, to that. Uh, is there a possibility that there would be a hospital that didn't? I'm, I'm sure that's true. Uh, these are... Uh, issues, while COVID-19 is unique, but the issues about how you deal with situations where there's a scarcity uh, are, is, are moral and ethical issues that, uh, you know, have to be faced other times as well. And my understanding is that there's a whole body of thought uh, developed in this area and that, you know, the, many of the hospitals already have a uh, policy in in place, so I think we, look. I, I think we let this we let this play out. Uh, we see where where we are. Uh, it's not something uh, you know. These rules are not something that should be written by politicians. These these should be uh, you know open to the public for the public to be able to comment on. Um, but these are things that should be developed by people who look at the ethics, people who understand medicine. Um, that's how it really should be, should be developed, in my opinion. Thank you. 
This is Laura Hancock from cleveland.com. I'm told I have the last question. Um, we hear a lot, like hourly, sometimes more, from people who are increasingly skeptical about what they're being told, frustrated by what they're not being told, such as differing predictions about the peak, what specific areas are being hardest hit, and how long we're gonna be stuck at home. Um, so we've had officials tell us that they would prefer not to share certain information because they're afraid the general public will become lax about social distancing, going out, that kind of thing. Um, how do you weigh these factors in what you share? Well, from the very first press conference uh, that we had about this actually in Cleveland, uh, we said we will tell you what we know when we know it. And I think that is what people expect of government. Uh, I think that's what they expect of me as, as the governor of the state of Ohio, as your governor, what, what they expect. Um, what that also means, though, is, is sometimes we're putting information out, um, you know, basically as we get it. And if you talk about the modeling, um, you have different models. And so you've seen us, you know, talk about different modeling. Uh, you know, we didn't try to suppress that. We tried to get it out. Um, you know, as far as the modeling, the, the, I think the most important thing for all of us to remember is we determine the, the way the story ends. We're, we're the ones that are going to make that decision. Uh, it's not the modelers. Uh, the modelers try to kind of predict. But one of the big variables in, in the modeling is, you know, what, what percentage of social distancing in there is in there? And what percentage of social distancing will people follow every single day? And so we write this story uh, every single day. But by, by putting the information out, uh, I, I think it's the, it is the right thing to do. Um, we have put out information that things look better. Uh, we put out information that you all are doing a good job. I got a few that aren't, a guy down in Cincinnati, but, you know, that we talked about in that last question, one of the questions. But uh, by and large, Ohioans are doing a good job. We've improved it. But we also have the obligation to tell you if we, if we don't continue to do this, it's not, it's not going to be, it's not going to be good. So I, I appreciate it very much. And uh, let me, uh, let me kind of wrap up here on, a, on a, a positive note. Ohio's home to outstanding performing arts organizations. Uh, today, I want to close with a virtual, a virtual performance uh, from the Columbus Symphony Chorus, a 120-member volunteer group that performs several times a year with the Columbus Symphony Orchestra. The chorus was scheduled to, preserve, to perform a concert on April 3rd. Uh, it was going to be called Songs of Comfort and Hope, but it was canceled. Uh, the planned encore from that concert was to be You'll Never Walk Alone from the musical Carousel. Members of the chorus, including our very own communications director, Lisa Peterson, uh, put together a virtual performance of the song as a surprise to their director, Ronald Jenkins. The lyrics, walk on, walk on with hope in your heart and you'll never walk alone. Do indeed bring us comfort and hope for better days ahead. We'll close with their performance.
much. We'll see you all tomorrow at 2 o'clock. Thank you.